My name is Ariana, and I am the health coach for Integrative Family Medicine of Asheville. And today I'm so excited to be able to speak with Beth Hoffman, who is this fabulous person mm -hmm. in town. She's a parenting coach. She's an educator, a parent, a love and logic instructor, facilitator. And just to give you some background of who Beth is, she has a bachelor's of science in social psychology, a master's in experiential education, and she has been in the experiential education field for over 20 years. She's also worked for yeah. <laughs> our adventure education programs, including 18 years with Outward Bound in both the U.S. and Africa. So cool. Uh -huh. And then in addition to that, she's an independent facilitator of Love and Logic for eight years, working with parents and educators. She's one of the founders of Asheville Task, the American Adventure Service Corps, a youth-based nonprofit that combines the power of wilderness leadership and service learning into value-forming experiences for young people. And she was a high school teacher in a public school system, served as the academic director for Wellspring Academy, is a mom to twin girls. So basically, Beth brings just this enormous wealth of experience and, and knowledge and perspective to our topic today, which is resilience parenting in the pandemic. This is part of our interview series where we're really trying to have conversations with experts to explore topics that can help us as parents to better support our kids during pandemic fatigue during what's happening in our society right now. Mm -hmm. Again, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. We're honored to have you. Uh, the, the first question I have today is, you know, pandemic parenting has brought this whole new spectrum of sweetness and challenge. And so even with what's really hard right now, how can we as parents build positive relationships with our kids? That's a great question. And I think first I want to start with why would we want to do that? And what the difference is between a relationship and an intentionally positive relationship? Mm -hmm. Why we want to create these positive relationships? The two main reasons are one, just in general, whether in a pandemic or non-pandemic, we know even from our own life experience, right? We've all had that person at work that we didn't have a positive relationship with. They ask us to do something and we usually find ways not to do it. Mm. Whereas someone we have a positive relationship with at work asks us to do something and we will move heaven and earth to do that. It's no different for our kids. When we like someone, we're willing to do things for them. So just in general and parenting, having that positive relationship is so powerful in eliciting the behaviors you want from your kids. In a pandemic setting where there are stressors and uncertainty, it is really important for our kids to have that attachment where they are seen and valued for who they are and that their amygdala, the stress response part of the brain, which is concerned with two questions, are we safe and are we loved? And only then when it answers yes is the external stimulus sent to the prefrontal cortex. So kids are in a pandemic as well as us, as the parents questioning, am I safe? Am I loved? Mm -hmm. So if we are intentional about creating these positive relationships, we can reduce that stress for our kids. Mm -hmm. And with all of us being at home and on top of each other, it can be a little more challenging to modify behavior. So if we have that positive relationship and we say, I need you just to give me some space, I have a work call, mm -hmm. they're more likely to do that because we have that positive relationship. What we have to remember is no matter how many strategies and techniques we have, the sum of that will never ever be greater than the positive relationships we have with our kids. In my opinion, it's one of our greatest underutilized parenting tools that we have. So how do we go about creating those positive relationships, right? During the pandemic, the last thing parents want to hear is, oh my God, there's another thing on my list I have to do, what? <laughs> It's not like that. It, it'll be different for each family. It can be really fun and moments of just pure joy. Ways, and it's going to match with where your kids are. So for example, we, my girls and I, we love dance parties. And that's a way for us, if we're seeing that stress or living on top of each other with homeschooling and two adults working from the same home, we just have that to go to. And during our dance parties, it can last for like 20 minutes. 
I mean, we even got a um, flashy, it's not quite a mirror ball, but it's like oh. strobe lights. Mm-hmm. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, we have up leveled the pandemic dance parties, but I can just see, and it's a great way to connect without even having to have conversation where we just like, whew, let's all let all that stress go and just dance it out. And they get so excited with the, you know, putting up the, turning the lights off and putting the globe, the strobing globe up. Um, but really what we want to, to do in creating these positive relationships with our kids is that connection and that connection without any agenda mm. or judgment. You know, Dr. Newfeld talks about the stages of attachment and he says it's so crucial that our kids are seen and celebrated for who they are. Mm -hmm. So if you watch your kids and you see what their interests are, they're going to show you the way to best create those positive relationships. So it may be like, oh, my kid is really into puzzles and I'm not. But taking that time to be like, Tuesday nights are family puzzle night and, and attaching with that interest, they're seen and celebrated for who they are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I pause and just quickly kind of reflect what I've heard you say yeah. so far? Because there's so much in what you're sharing that mm -hmm. first, maybe we should pause and say, why would we want positive relationships? Mm -hmm. And that's coming back to, we're more likely, all of us are more likely to actually collaborate with and do something for a person that we like. Mm -hmm. And so if we're building a relationship with our kids that allows for them to like us and us to like them, there's just going to be a greater degree of, yeah, I'll do that, mom. Sure. Yes. And also it sounds like scientifically and neurologically what's happening when we're doing that is that our kid maybe feels more safe and secure. Mm -hmm. What that does is it helps them to feel less stressed which makes it easier for their prefrontal cortex to come on. And that's the part of the brain that says, yes, mom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And then ways we can do that so far that you've shared one really kind of coming up with fun ways that we can just engage and have fun together, dance parties or whatever it is that your kids interested in and your child themselves is the, the window to figure that out. Just watching them you know, puzzles, don't like puzzles, but let's put in the time because then, you know, our child will feel seen and respected and valued. And that's golden. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. You summed it up. Great. <laughs> well, I, this is also, it's, 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 and, and one, on one, on the one hand, it's kind of common sense. And on yeah. the other hand, I feel like it can get lost when, you know, we're stressed and we're not yeah. able to just pause and think. But when you step back, it's like, oh, well, that's really reasonable. Mm -hmm. Building a positive relationship, that does seem really foundational. Yeah. It's a way to have a positive relationship with our kids. Yes. And I think it's, it, we can, it, it's easy for us to assume just by the nature of parent-child that we have a positive relationship. Mm -hmm. You have a relationship, but it's not necessarily positive that we have to be intentional about. Mm -hmm. So it can be micro moments during the day, making every hello and goodbye count. So yes, we're, we may all be living on top of each other, but there's still that first hello in the morning and that last goodbye at night. Mm -hmm. And so really making that time, if you need to, to add extra few minutes to your morning for that morning cuddle and that just connecting and then when you're saying good night, like being really intentional and tucking them in, depending what age, right? If they're younger, you're probably there for a while. <laughs> but my girls are 10, but I'm just really intentional about when I tuck them in. Um, so I say to them, of all the girls in the whole world, how did I get so lucky to get you? And so that they go to bed thinking like, how did she get so lucky to get me? We just end every night like that. And, it, and they're sweet. They'll respond of all the moms in the whole world. How did I get so lucky to get you? Right. So just those little micro moments where we can, it doesn't take that much extra effort, but it is creating that positive relationship. 
when I would pick my girls up from school, the first thing I would say to them was, I missed you so much, mm-hmm. right? Imagine as an adult, we're getting picked up from work by someone we love. And right away, they're like, how was your day? What did you do? Who did you talk to? You'd be like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I just had a busy day at work. <laughs> if that person picked us up and said, I missed you so much. Oh, it would just fill us up. So making, and I know kids are starting to go back to school and it's stressful. They're six feet apart and they're wearing masks. So imagine if when you pick your kiddo up from school, the first thing you say is, I missed you so much. Even after a year together, you don't necessarily, (laughs) it's okay to just, I missed you so much. Just not the best self, if maybe not from your actual (laughs) moment to moment feelings. To, yeah. To, and thought has home, power like work almost. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Mm. So those, those micro moments are wonderful. Um, knowing our kids love language, Gary Chapman's Dr. Gary Chapman's work mm-hmm. regarding love language, that can be a really efficient way to connect with our kids and build that positive relationship. So I have one child whose love language is physical touch another that's quality time. Mm. And the thing I love about quality time is she just wants to be with me. So she helps me make dinner. You know, she helps me do laundry. We cuddle on the couch and talk about some interesting book she wants to write. That's filling up her love bank and that's creating that positive relationship. How did you figure out her love language? Did you, because the online tests to figure out your love language usually are targeted more towards adults with their... uh... Yeah. And they've got, they've got uh, an assessment for teens, but for the younger kids, what some of them will be really obvious. Like my one daughter is physical touch. And I mean, that's just her go-to for everything. Cuddle, cuddle, cuddle. And physical touch are also those kids are like, I'm so excited. And they wrestle. They're also, it's not just lovey, lovey. It's also like wrestle. I just need to always be touching you, whether we're wrestling Mm -hmm. or it might be yeah. pachycephalosaurus, like we're pushing heads really hard. Or yes. in Kylosaurus, we're like taking our tails with the tail. Cl- anyway, yeah. So you're no, you, you're, you know you're I'm telling you, my little one is really into that. <laughs> <right now. laughs> I didn't he, even know some of the species that existed. In and that. that's that positive relationship. He, by the fact that you are also knowing this and having conversations about dinosaurs that might not be your hot topic right now, he's seen, he's being seen and celebrated for who he is. Hmm. I, so fun ways to engage, but micro moments and yeah. then noticing what they're into and playing like yeah. thinking to and immersing in that. It's helpful to think that, Oh, when I'm, when we're being Pachycephalosaurus is fighting gently with our heads, pushing really hard against each other. I'm seeing and valuing him. It's not something I've necessarily been present to, present with in the moment, you know? Yeah, he feels seen. Yeah. So, so for so little funny. kids, just noticing how they show up and what they're what they're asking for in terms of how they want to engage with you. And for preteens, teens, there's online assessment. Yeah. And so for the for the love language, I, I find asking our little kids if if a mommy really loves their little girl, how does she show that love? Oh. What a great question. And their answer will usually indicate their love language. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If I love the love language. It's also helpful for us in our partnerships, you know, because if you and your partner have different love languages, you can be like, oh, missing each other. Yeah. Um, and then I think the one, one other thing that we, in this pandemic time when we are at home and feeling like, oh my God, I have so much going on remembering helping our kids work and having them help us work mm-hmm. is also a way to create that positive relationship. So sitting around and having girl, we do girl talk laundry time. And, and sometimes they come in characters, you know, <laughs> coffee talk around the big pile of laundry and we'll just fold laundry and chat. And 10 is such a fun age, right? Cause they're kind of getting into like, just topics that are more interesting than <laughs> No offense to dinosaurs and paleontologists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it's a different level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, right. And so that's, so we're getting the laundry folded because I don't know about you, but I, I definitely have that habit of I'm pretty timely with laundry, but then it sits in a laundry basket for a week in my living room. 
So I was like, girls, and they're here with us all the time. Let's have coffee talk laundry time. So we're connecting and we're getting that done. That's beautiful. Yeah. And then the last one that I'm going to end on with um, positive relationships which might seem kind of funny, but the best way to preserve a positive relationship and to create one is to avoid power struggles with our kids. Mm -hmm. Power struggles will kill a positive relationship and there's different techniques and that's a whole talk unto itself. But one way that I will leave with is don't engage. Our kids have hooks and I will say an activity that is pretty fun to do as a parent and with your parenting partner is to brain dump a list of all the hooks your kids use to pull you into a power struggle. And then you can put it out on the cabinet and, and there it is. So when you're making dinner and you hear your kids say, you know, well, that's not fair. Well, John's mother lets them have cookies for dinner. You're like, ah, this is a hook. <laughs> They're trying to pull me into a power struggle. Don't engage. Don't engage. Right? Just say, well, thank you for sharing. Well, that's interesting. And then just don't engage. So just more. And like I said, avoiding power struggles is a whole separate talk. But just that awareness around not engaging with power struggles. Nobody wins. Biggest way to just sabotage positive relationship building with our kids is to engage in power struggles. Don't do it. And the whole different topic, but you actually, a couple of years ago, did this fabulous community class with us on peaceful parenting and it's up on our website and it, you, you shared like some very, yeah, that was the whole thing. It was like seven easy steps to avoid power struggles. So we can just funnel folks over to that for some more around how to do it. But what, what I heard you just say is to build positive relationships. We want to do this because it's like the, the biggest ticket we have to helping our kids to be collaborative and listen well and work with us and, and have more peace in our relationships. Mm-hmm. Biggest ways to do it. It sounded like, I think five, avoid power struggles, um, do work together. Mm-hmm. The work of the home, a collaboration and fun. Mm-hmm. So they're helping they're valued you're getting help you're getting something done mm-hmm. uh, micro moments it doesn't have to be all day long you're engaged with them and working and doing housework you know it can just be these little moments make your hellos and goodbyes count make mm-hmm. good morning and good night count mm-hmm. and have it be in language that they understand is like they're really special and valued and loved mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then have fun ways to like play together but, and, and pay attention to them to see how that would best look. Is it puzzles? Is it dance party with the disco ball? It's so great. Is it yeah. two hours in the creek with your son? Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Is it, and then make time for that because that's what's going to help them to really feel seen and valued. Mm-hmm. Play yeah. is play is the language of childhood. Oh, and it is yeah. also the one of the quickest ways to build those positive relationships with our kids. Yeah. And whatever that play looks like. That makes a lot of sense and ties back to what you said in the beginning, where if a a child is feeling safe and secure and accepted, Mm -hmm. that's a child who's going to be acting differently than a Mm -hmm. child who doesn't, who's feeling kind of unsafe or undervalued. And I think play and playing with Mm -hmm. children is one, it's like a child who's playing happily with their parents is probably a child who is feeling safe and secure. Yeah. I would and think. so important during the uncertainty of this pandemic yeah. for them to feel that, that, yep, you're loved and you're safe and you're sec- secure. Okay. And it's, it's good for us to dust off our adulthood and get into our play. Yeah. Right. Play is healthy for everyone. Yeah. And we need to remember that as adults too. It helps us manage our pandemic stresses. Absolutely. When find you, opportunities when you to play. Absolutely. There's a, a great interview with Brene Brown and the Nagoski okay. twins. I don't know if you, did you hear that? No. Oh, I'll send you the link. It's yeah. the, the, the Nagoski, twin, Nagoski twins. Oh, is it the burnout? Do they write the burnout yeah. book? Yes, yes I burnout, did hear burnout, that. Burnout. Yes. Where they're talking about how there's the stress cycle. So as yes. for everyone, for human beings, there's the part where we get stressed and then physiologically, normally we would metabolize that stress by moving and connecting, mm-hmm. and playing and being creative. But if we never get around to those things, if we never walk, run, yes. play, 
the stress just stays. We get stuck. Stuck in stress mode. Yeah. Play is a way for us to tend to our stress as yes. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Bring play back. I can yeah. see the bumper sticker. Bring play back. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of segueing into the next question, I, I think this neatly ties us into for families right now, you know, I've, I've heard you in the past talk about creating a family culture, Yeah. doing that intentionally around values. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that means and, and how it could help families as a whole right now? Yes. Oh, I love this topic. Family culture. And I don't know if it's my outward bound background with it's so heavily um, rooted in the culture and the history of outward bound and how we share that with our students, Mm -hmm. but it creating family culture, it, when we create family culture, we are providing a compass for our family, especially in times of crisis and disturbance. And so when we create it, we are looking at who are we as a family? What are our values? What are the rituals that we have? What are the rituals around connection? And all of those not only create this compass, this North Star for us, especially in these difficult times, they give our kids a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest things we can give our kids is that sense of belonging. It is a human need. If they're not getting that met at home, they will look for it outside the home Mm -hmm. and often not necessarily in a positive way. A sense of belonging can be met in positive terms and negative terms. So that's just kind of the umbrella of the power of creating family culture When we create these rituals for our kids, we're we're symbolizing the identity of the family. Mm -hmm. So when they're outside our home, whether young or older, they have that as their guiding force. Mm -hmm. And when we have rituals around connection, it allows us to repair. There's no such thing as a perfect family. And there's going to be, especially under these stressful times, we might yell, our kids might not handle online schooling that well, right? There might be these conflicts. But if we've created this family culture and ritual around connection, then it's easier to do that repair. And what we know in research is if, if we yell at our kids and we repair, we dissolve the effect of the yelling on our kids. And so that repair is so important and we can create rituals around that and check-ins, right? Family meetings on Sundays and we do the appreciation. There's different ways that we can create that. Um, For me, family is the long game and it's not so that I'm putting stress on myself, right? I say I'm parenting a 10 year old and raising a really amazing adult. Mm -hmm. And that I want to be my legacy and gift to this world are these amazing adults that will go out in the world with empathy and with strong values and integrity and optimism and hope. And that starts with family. Their first exposure to a community and the culture of a community is their family, whether that's intentional or not intentional, but that will be their baseline. Mm -hmm. And then when they go out, right? So family is, it's a long game. Raising our kids is a long game. This is the foundation right now. This is the foundation built for the expectations of how relationships will happen in the future or how to interact with community when, as an adult. And so the importance of creating family culture for you comes back to, on the one hand, a compass or hard times, a North, or North Star, mm-hmm. whole family to track towards and realign towards. But also it's about being intentional around how to help a child or help your children mm-hmm. to have a very strong foundation for yes. going out in the world with the values that you hope for them to carry with them. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And when we create family culture, we're creating a connected family Mm -hmm. and we need that more than ever right now are these connected families. And I find what I love about creating family culture too, is it's a collaborative process. And when it's a class, I would imagine you could do it in a way where it's top down. So I guess I should say this, when you create fat family <laughs> culture, it needs to be collaborative. It is not, not <laughs> yeah, it's not top down. I mean, we've all worked in those environments where they're like, this is the culture, you know, and here's the memo. And you're like, screw that. <laughs> right? We need to collaborate it. And, you know, <laughs> there's some saying, I don't know who said it, but I just love it. And that is nobody heckles the play from the stage. Oh, wow. So if we involve our kids and hear, right? Like we want to hear the Hawk and Gillette family. What does that mean to you? When we're out in the, in the world, what do we want people to see in us and to hear what their ideas are? It's crucial. And then because of the collaborative process, you've got the buy-in. So this is, this is a, a lateral. It's never a top-down process. And these are also moments where you're building that positive relationship. You're sitting around the table and talking about who are we as a family and creating family culture can be a lot of things. It can, it can be that very intentional. Like we're sitting down and we're discussing, we're coming up with our family mission statement or our family motto, whatever it might be. And then it can be rituals that just kind of naturally appear and then become very special. So for example, years ago, I had terrible adrenal in thyroid issues. And by the time Friday came, I was done, right? Between parenting and work. Yeah, I had nothing left. So we started carrying, carry out food, and we got to watch in front of the TV, which is a really big deal in our house. And now we look forward to it. Oh, it's almost Friday. We get to carry out food. And, you know, the girls are like plotting all week. What movie are we going to watch for Friday night movie night? You know, family movie night. And it's, yeah. and so we've kind of codified a ritual that just appeared out of survival, right? Like Friday came and I'm like, my adrenals are done. My thyroid <laughs> is not helping. I'm I'm done. Break. <laughs> not only are we carrying out food, I'm doing it in front of the TV. Yeah. Right. And so then that's just kind of a ritual that emerges. And then, so you'll see like some, some rituals will emerge and, and, latch on to it, right? Co- codify that. Uh, Cause these rituals are very grounding for our kids. I have to imagine that the continuity of your Friday night carry out movie night during the pandemic yeah. has to have been very grounding. Yes. That is the best word I can think of for your, for your girls. It's a certain thing and an uncertain time. Yeah. And when we're in an uncertain time, it, even if we're able to protect our kids from it, we're still feeling it. And that energy can still seep out. We, those are anchor points for us. Mm -hmm. These, no matter what's going on every Sunday, we do our family meeting every Friday night is carry out family movie night, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. Mm -hmm. Family meeting, which you have a great Ted talk on family meetings. I'll just do a quick plug for that. (laughs) If folks are interested in exploring that further. So a family meeting is a touching point to come together and to check in. And then another ritual that's about relaxing together, which has to be great for you and your husband too, to just, yes. okay, we're just, we're not on, <laughs> we're sitting back and we needed that. Yeah. And we're getting organized. So the week ahead, it doesn't all like for so long. And I'm sure other parents, whether it's the mom or dad that takes that role, but there's usually one parent that takes that role in the family where in their head is the entire family Mm -hmm. schedule, extracurricular activities for kids, you know, dog sitter, (laughs) shots, vaccines for the dogs, they keep it all. Mm -hmm. And what a family meeting does is they help share that. So one of the things we do in family meeting is we do the week Mm -hmm. and we look ahead and I can say in the girls now, you know, at 10, they have their own calendars and they write it all down. Okay. On this day is your Mm -hmm. art class on this day. You're, you know, doing your online music. Mm -hmm. We've got the dog sitter coming on this day. And so they write it in there. So everyone's responsible. And also with that certainty, you were just talking about that here's as a family, we're 
laying down the rubric for the week, but for your kids, it's like, okay, this is what's happening on this day. It, it adds another layer of what to expect during a time that might otherwise feel kind of topsy-turvy. And it gives them agency. And, and in certain times we lose that agency. We don't know. We don't know when you're going back to school. We don't know how these vaccines will affect grandma and grandpa and when we can see them. And so they lose agency in their life. But when we can find those moments, even if it's just a week at a time being in control, yeah, it can be very soothing. It sounds like it. Also, what a foundational skill to be layering in right now, because time management and looking ahead, that's prefrontal cortex. And uh, that, that's really important in young adulthood <laughs> and adulthood in general. So these, these ways that we come together to create family culture can also be ways in which we're helping our kids to grow. And I want to recap what you said, but this also just so neatly ties into my last question for you. So I'm just going to dive forward and then recap at the end. Cause, cause my, my last question is how do we help our kids to build resilience? And this just sounds like one central pillar for how you could do that. Tell, if you, if you will, tell me more about what you think can help our kids to build resilience right now or what we can do to help them build resilience. Yeah. The exciting thing for me regarding resilience is that resilient kids are not born. They are made. Mm. It is a skill that we can teach our kids. It's not in their DNA. It's not a birth right it are it is skills and the other thing about resiliency is it's not a standalone right resilient actually has numerous traits under it which helps us break down and look at how we can start addressing and building those in our kids okay dr michelle borba i can't recommend her work enough just came out with a book called thrivers and it She's, it took 30 years to write this book because she was looking at longitudinal studies with kids during different times of adversity and who was able to bounce back and who wasn't and what were those commonalities. And what she found, yeah, it's fantastic. The book just came out, um, but she's doing a lot of podcasts and her website is great. I think it's Dr. Michelle Borba. If you Googled her, you'll find it. She's got some great handouts and resources for parents. Fabulous. In her research, what she found is that there's actually seven traits that make up resilience and they are confidence. The first one, and she said, that's actually the greatest one in their research. That's what they found is confident kids are resilient kids. So how as parents do we help, especially in an uncertain time, like a pandemic and where they're not getting that social engagement with peers, how do we build that confidence? And what they found in their research is confident kids um, have an understanding and appreciation of who they are, not what their parents want them to be. And that may be hard for us parents out there to hear that, that if we truly want to instill confidence in our kids, we need to put aside our pictures of what we Mm -hmm. think they are, hope they are, and whatever it is, want them to be and listen to who they are. Mm. And you can do that by exploring what are their strengths. Our culture spends a lot of time with kids looking at their weaknesses and building those up and not enough time on their strengths. And if anyone out there is parenting kids with learning differences, I hear you. Both my girls have a plethora of learning differences. And this is a model in the LD world. Focus on their weaknesses, build those, build those. Which yes, with LD kids, we do need to look at those. And at the same time, look at their strengths and really feed that because that's going to help with their confidence. And so taking a step back and being like, what does my kid like to spend time doing? Looking at pictures and all the pictures, this is when they're really smiling. When they're on that rock face climbing, they're really smiling. Or look at this picture in the background. I didn't even notice it. Zoe was drawing, you know, wow, we're on the top of Sam's knob and she's drawing with her notebook. 
really taking that time as a parent to be like, okay, I'm checking what my, what I want. And let's look at what my kids are into, what they're passionate about and what their strengths are. In her book, she talks about um, Michael Phelps's mom doing that, that his age was so severe that he was told by all his teachers, his mother was told that he's not going to amount to anything that we've never seen ADD this so severe. And so she watched, she took a step back and she watched to see what his interests were, what lit him up and swimming and being in the pool. She saw him content. And so she she followed that. Yeah. She, I mean, what an amazing mom. She followed that route for him. Mm -hmm. And because we focus on our, on our weaknesses as adults, or when we focus on our kids' weaknesses, we begin to identify as having, as you know, it seems to me from the outside, listening to what you're saying, that by only focusing on the weaknesses of our kids, our kids can start to think that that's what they are. Yes. That, that they are the struggle to keep up or that they are behind because they can't read as well, or that they have these problems and that that's, that's what they're focusing on. But if we can acknowledge weaknesses, but focus on strengths, yeah, then they can start to identify with, you know, I'm not great at reading, but I'm a fish in water and I love being in the water and I'm a really good swimmer. I'm the best swimmer. And that Mm -hmm. confidence. And that confidence then becomes the voice in their head when they face adversity, whether collective, like a pandemic or individually. And that voice is like, I got this. I got this. A confident person can have that self-talk of I've got this. This will be hard. We're not going to candy coat it, but I've got this. But I can do hard things. I can do hard things. Yeah, absolutely. So in her research, that's what she found that of the seven traits, that one is the most important in building a resilient, she calls them thrivers in building a thriver, a resilient kiddo. That's beautiful. Uh, Yeah. And then the other one that I think was really powerful in her research was empathy empathetic kids are resilient kids. Mm -hmm. And she quoted a study that came out right before the pandemic. So I'm not even sure how the pandemic played into it, but in over 30 years of the American child, there has been a decline in empathy by 40%. Yeah. Why? 40%. Yeah, she doesn't go into the why I have my hunches (laughs) of the why. And it's screen time and pop culture, because we know empathy is a mere neuron for our kids to be empathetic, they need to see it. Um, It's a mere neuron that lies in the prefrontal cortex. So not only do they need to see it, but they can't be in amygdala, they need to be in prefrontal cortex. So building empathy, what it's doing is it's creating the mindset of we, not me. And what her research found is that that really helps with mental health. We're in this together, not just me. There's other people. Uh, And that leads to resiliency. We've got this, you know, and even language around the pandemic of like, we've got this, this is, this isn't just our country. This is the world. This isn't just our family. This is, you know, it layers out. We're in this together. We're surviving together. We're surviving together. Mm -hmm. We, not me. Yeah. And then I'll just go through the other ones quickly because they are, I think, very interesting. The other one is self-control. And this is, they can put the brakes on their impulses. This is a big area because kids just by the nature of not having a fully developed prefrontal cortex are very impulsive. Mm -hmm. And then you layer on kiddos with learning differences, right? ADD, that's executive function. Uh, So this is something that we can teach them. How do you regulate? And for me and the work I do with clients as well as my own kids is elongating, helping them learn to elongate the pause between stressor and reaction. When that stressor happens, our cave brain wants to react right away. But if we can take a deep breath, if we can take the long pause, if we can walk away and give some time and then come back, we're in a better space with our reaction 
And we're going to have that self-control that resilient kids have. The long pause. The long pause. Yep. I, t- I teach it to my girls is the power, the power pause. And that the power pause is this superhero, much like Wonder Woman. And so when you have a stressor, you need to become power pause. I love that. Captain power pause. That's, no, that, that's beautiful for younger kids to have. Exactly. Younger kids can be that. Yeah. And even you can draw it out together and be like, what does Captain Power Pause look like? Does it work all the time? No. Right. Because sometimes they're so triggered, but it's, it's how I talked about. It's the long game. None of this is overnight. Yes. Resilient kids are made, not born, but they're not made overnight. Right. They're made over many years. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Captain, Captain Power Pause. The other trait that she found with resilient kids is integrity. And this comes back to what we were talking about with family culture. They have a strong moral code and it's usually established within the family. So like our family motto is be brave, be kind, stay wild. And so sometimes when the girls are leaving for something, I'll say, you know, I love you. Don't forget. And they're like, I know, be brave, be kind, stay wild. Right. And so that's kind of creating their because we want that, right? Like we want them to be brave. We want them to be kind and have that empathy. And we want them to stay wild. Be true to yourself, right? Don't culture, especially raising girls, tries to domesticate girls. And yes, no. Not <laughs> that. So that integrity piece is really rooted into what we were talking about with that family culture piece. Okay. The other one, which I just love, the other trait they found is curiosity. kids that are curious are open to other ideas and are problem solvers and curious kids are resilient kids. And this is actually something I can give parents right now, an easy thing to do to help build that curiosity that leads to resilient kids. And that is don't solve all their problems. Believe in them enough, love them enough to step away and let them solve their problems. Be there as a coach or asking questions or mentoring, but don't do it for them. Every time we do something for our kids, we are robbing them of that experience and that confidence and the curiosity that comes from solving it on their own. Mm -hmm. Let them problem solve, let them figure it out because by doing that, they're going to realize they can figure out problems and they'll get probably more curious about, well, how am I going to figure out this challenge? Because I know I can, because I've done those other ones before I can do this. Yeah. And if you think of that in the lens of resiliency, so often that's what resiliency requires. It, you, this adversity faces you and you have to be like, whoa, I need to think out of the box. I need to figure, I need to problem solve this. A lot of dealing with crisis and adversity is problem solving and, and in such a way that is out of the box. What's well, and it seems like, I mean, it's all of these things. It's, it's problem solving, thinking out of the box, but then if knowing how to self-regulate so that if you're scared and stressed and fearful of failure, you're able to do a power pause, adult version, <laughs> and like calm down and then come back to it and keep trying and not reach for an escape that then causes everything to get worse, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're touching on something she talks about, which is the multiplier effect. One of these alone is powerful. Two of these together multiplies the effect of both of them. So just like you said, okay, well, if I, if I can be curious and problem solve and self-regulate and have the confidence that I can figure it out, those three traits alone multiply because they're being used in combination. And neuroscience wise, I've been listening to a neurobiologist uh, from the medical school at Stanford University uh, talking about how briefly the, our brains want to default to the neural wiring of our childhood. Yes. The, the way that we figured out how to do things as children and young adults, kind of up until around 25 as adults beyond 25, that's what our brain wants to go back to. And we can change it, but it's hard. It takes, it takes some, some focus and some urgency and work. And so what we're helping our kids to neurally wire in right now becomes their foundation for resiliency. In yeah. This is, we're helping them to lay down the neural networks now. Yeah, absolutely. 
so that when they're in those moments and they, yeah, they go to their patterns of childhood, they've got it. They've got it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the last two traits are perseverance. But the key is these kids persevere without the token economy. Mm. They persevere without the gold star or the external recognition. So making sure with our kids that we aren't giving gold stars for everything and that we're really truly developing this intrinsic motivation that will feed that perseverance for them. Yeah. And then the last one of the trait that she discovered was optimism and hope. Uh, And yeah, that one is for me, you know, in teaching how like, okay, so that's great. What's the tangible? How do I do it? And I think when I teach this to my own girls, I talk about the power of words and that our brain does not know the difference between actual, like, the, the physical, actual, and our thought, right? It will respond to our thought. And so I talk about how powerful our thought is. So if we keep saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, right? So with dis- severe dyslexia, I can't read, I'll never read, I can't read. They're telling their brain and their brain's like, yeah, we're never going to read. Okay, let's just yeah. shut down that part of the brain. Yeah. And so with the hope the optimism and the hope really having those conversations with your kids about the power of the words they use and the self-talk. I mean, we also need that pep talk because as parents too, and parenting in the pandemic, it's so easy to be like, Oh my God, I'm letting them watch too much screen time. Or we have waffles every Wednesday for dinner. And then I'm such a bad mom, like that self-talk. And then your brain's like, yeah, we're a bad mom. Let's have milk duds for Thursday dinner (laughs) and sugar for Friday. Right. Cause So watching that self-talk and the power of our words will help with this hope and optimism and perspective, right? So when our kids are like, oh, you know, everyone's invited to the birthday party and I'm not. Okay, let's look at your actual belief. Can you make friends with the outcome? So your actual belief is you are not going to be invited to the birthday party or the actual event. You're not going to be invited. Your belief is you're the only one left out and no one likes you. Can you make friends with that? Is that even a reality, right? Is that really true? Maybe she, maybe her birthday party because of the pandemic, her mom said only one friend over in the backyard, right? So showing how we make up these stories and can we make friends with the consequence? What will happen if you don't, if you're not invited to the party? Yeah. So that can all feed that, that hope and optimism. It seems to me that being human can sometimes feel like being in a room of mirrors Mm -hmm. or like the, you know, emotional responses and the stories in our mind and, you know, the the fears and and uncertainties. And when we have a strong foundation um, of confidence, Mm -hmm. know our strengths, we have been able to have support towards, you know, perseverance, hope, Mm -hmm. um, curiosity, problem solving then we can get our way out of the mirrors sort of and be able to kind of move forward in whatever the challenge is and not get stuck as children or as adults. And, and it's hard and also important foundational for for us as adults and for our kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I think overriding all of this is our kids just knowing and being rooted in the knowledge that no matter what happens to them, regard, this is regarding resilience, no matter what happens to them, they will always be loved. Mm. Dr. Borba tells a story in her book about Elizabeth Smart being abducted from her house and living those nine months of absolute terror and horror that often involve daily rape. And she said the thing that got her through, right? Like that, you want to talk about resilient, like surviving those nine months. Um, she said the thing, the turning point for her was her mother always told all the kids, no matter what happens to you, you will always be loved. You will always be loved. And so she knew no matter what was happening to her in those nine months, she would, she'd be loved. Which I think if you're a parent, you're probably crying right now. Yeah. (laughs) But also just 
circles back down to the central truth that what we say to our kids learn. Yeah. Um, and how we communicate and what we say becomes the story about who they are and yeah. what they can do and what they're capable of and how they're worthy or not. Yeah. And so it's not about resiliency and then there's not hardship because there's going to be hardship. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be challenge. There could even be really bad things worse than the pandemic. Yeah. It's about how can we create this like so strong core, this deep, deep, deep roots of certainty in our children that they are loved, that they are valued, that they are, that they are safe with us. Yeah. That they have strengths. They are not their weakness. They are their strengths. That they can problem solve, that they can mm-hmm. be curious, move forward, all of these, all of these things that you've shared. And then going back to that family culture that, that it's just all ties together so neatly, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. Building positive relationships. Part of that is these things that we say that become what they remember in hard moments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. having family culture around that these yeah. practices of relating to them connecting to them being together doing things together that really helps to repair when you talked about the repair is so important because without it you know that, that that's where you can maintain the positive relationship without being perfect because no one's perfect and yeah. if you think about the japanese way of repairing broken ceramic where they use gold to kind of bring the pieces together so this broken thing becomes more beautiful than it was before it broke and that's kind of what some of this is doing you know in terms of the resiliency practice as a family and as a parent for our kids Mm -hmm. helping to create a a sense of continuity and and togetherness even in the midst of everything that's hard yeah sometimes it can get better because of that yeah. And I think kind of along what you're saying too, in, in like in this pandemic and when things are hard, because they are going to be hard, right? Life harder for others for sure, but everyone's going to have a challenge. And it's important that we give our kids the permission to feel. And often as parents, we'll, we'll try to redirect those feelings for our kids. Oh, it's just so hard and I'm lonely and all those things. And it's crucial that we allow those, not dwell on them, but we allow them. And what you'll find is if you allow those, then they don't dwell. And if you don't allow them, they stay there. They stay in in the cycle of self-thought. So if they're like, it's so hard, I'm so lonely, whatever it might be. And we say it is. And same with you, right? Like if you're... (laughs) It's hard parenting in the pandemic. It's like, I'm just really stressed right now. I'm trying to manage you all with school and work. And I'm just really stressed. That's fantastic, right? Because not only are you telling your kids they have permission to feel, you're showing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that is, excuse me, sorry, really important as well. Yeah. What I heard you say, and I want to recap because I had to plug in my computer and I had to wear a cough, is that it's, When there are emotions coming up, it's so important to allow them Mm -hmm. and to give them a safe space to be expressed. And part Mm -hmm. of what we can do that is own what we feel and share it in appropriate ways with our kids. It's okay to say and to own, man, mama is really stressed today. It's just, there's a lot going on and I'm feeling a lot of stress. Modeling healthy emotional communication, Mm -hmm. expressing emotions. We're giving our kids permission to do the same with us. Yes. Absolutely. And yeah. you'll find, especially if you're modeling, like, I'm really stressed. This is how I'm going to take care of myself. And then you can model some of these resiliency stuff. I'm curious if there's another way I can manage my day so I don't feel that stress. I, how can I self-regulate what's going on for me? And if you can model those, then you're, you're modeling resiliency for your kids. You're modeling that perseverance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you can say, like, Oof, I got a big day today. It's, I got a lot going on, but um, I'm going to do it. And then tonight, let's have a giant dance party. And they're like, yeah, right? So you're modeling like this perseverance and then, and, and then celebrations at the end that you're not, you don't dwell in it, right? You don't, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard. We, we want to acknowledge the permission to feel and then model how we move through that. And move through it with, Curiosity, enjoyment, celebration, as opposed to 
mm-hmm. just begrudging suffering. Yeah. I had a, a psychologist say in an interview with, this is with Dr. Will Hamilton, <clears throat> you know, if suffering is going to be on the table, no matter what, then it's not, can I have suffering or not? It's mm-hmm. suffering, just suffering or suffering with a story, suffering with purpose yeah. to extrapolate that to this mm-hmm. on the table for all mm-hmm. of us. Mm-hmm. It can just be challenging and hard mm-hmm. or it can be challenging for a greater cause, a, a greater purpose in our family systems. Yeah. You know, this is, this is challenged because we can do hard things as a family and we can get through at the end of the day, we can put the disco ball up and we can dance it out. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. finding ways to build that way of connecting to ourselves and to our kids. Yeah. is a resilience tool for all of us. Yeah. Okay. So in sum. Yeah. Parenting relationships. How do we build positive relations with our kids right now? One, acknowledge that it's important and why. And then in terms of some specific reasons or ways we can do that, we can connect to them as they are, watch them and get curious about them. What are they into and how can we connect to them on that level? Mm-hmm. We make our micro moments throughout the day really matter. Mm-hmm. So good morning. I love you. Hi. I'm so happy to see you today. Like, like just infusing these, these, these little moments throughout the day with love and, and excitement and warmth and acceptance at the end of the day of all the little boys in the world. How did I get so lucky to have my Luke? And yeah. Saying that to them so they, they really feel it. Mm-hmm. There was one other piece there around really making some time to work together, to play together mm-hmm. in terms of doing the laundry together and having, it sounded like an SNL skit, doing the <laughs> laundry talk uh, or, you know, getting outside playing in the creek or playing puzzles, but, but, but doing things together because that's a place where we can repair. Mm-hmm that gold lining. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of family culture, that's so important because it's a, the load starts, the North starts, the compass. This is, this is where as a family, we can come back to center. We can create for our kids a sense of identity, Mm -hmm. like rooted in values that the whole family shares. We co-create family culture. Mm -hmm. We're asking our kids like, who are we? (laughs) Who are we together? Who are you? What do you value? What's important to you? And asking them to get involved means you don't have a kid who's like, uh, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like you're, this is collaborative. And, and then with that rituals coming together on a regular basis, which adds consistency and expectation and the ability to have something to depend on in an uncertain time, Friday movie nights, Wednesday, we eat outside around a fire, you know, whatever it is that your family figures out, having ways to come together consistently. And then resilience. I loved what you, everything you shared from the, that researcher, Mich, Dr. Dr. Michelle Borba. Mm-hmm. I think it's just fantastic around how to thrive and how to support our kids in thriving. Confidence, focusing on strengths. And confidence means knowing who they are, not what we want them to be. Yeah. And that's huge. Uh, mm-hmm. Strength and problem solving, curiosity, perseverance. Yeah. Missing a few maybe integrity integrity yeah um empathy and empathy yeah and hope. All of and hope. anything else that you want to share for parents that you feel like is just any last thought on resilience and parenting in the pandemic right now that you want to conclude with um i guess i think maybe just this idea that there is no perfect parent but there are millions of good parents. Mm -hmm. And if we strive for that perfection, we will miss the day-to-day beauty of our kids and our relationship with our kids. And so the bar should just be, I'm a good parent. We live in a world that is flooded with messages of perfection, award shows, right? All of that. And there, I truly believe there's no perfect parent, but there are a million good parents and a million ways to be a good parent. And so um, just, yeah, keep that in mind and be gentle with yourself. Parenting in a pandemic is, it hasn't been done for a hundred years and doing it with the challenges of digital, you know, and um, yeah. Okay. So Bring the bar down a little bit. And instead of focusing on perfection and then missing opportunities, 
on a day-to-day basis, really aiming for good and aiming for the quality of our connection and repairing and supporting and, and building each other up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. As always, it was a delight. (laughs) 